So here I am once again, not planning to do a stream, and here I am turning on all the equipment, going live on my YouTube channel to talk about something that I didn't want to talk about ever again. But we keep on talking about it. This time, I think it's a good thing. We're talking about John MacArthur and the continuing saga of neglect neglect on the issue of abuse at his church uh, and now we have an article being written from Christianity Today Kate Shelnett uh, wrote it uh, about an elder an elder who was on the team who was one of the, like the main guys there well respected calling out Grace Community Church, his former church, his former pastor, John MacArthur, for not pursuing justice to the best of their ability. Now, if you're familiar with my channel, most likely you came to my channel because of what was going on with Wendy Gray, Eileen Gray. Like, uh, you, you came because of one of these stories. Um uh, Probably some connection to Julie Roy's and uh, her reporting on this topic. That's most likely the reason why you're here on my channel at all. Um, so first, thank you for being here. But I feel like it's an important thing for me to cover. Not because, you know, like the YouTube algorithm stuff, but because that's kind of how my channel has progressed. Um, a lot of people have found... So like a safe harbor, that's like I was talking with some friends this week, and that, that's my thought about this channel. I want it to be a safe harbor for people who have been in the church and have been hurt within the church. And a lot of you have found that safe harbor here on this channel, so I feel like it's important for us to continue to talk about this story as it progresses. And it's been a slow progression. We haven't talked about it really in about, I don't know, like at least four or five months since we've seen any progress in it. But today we're talking about it and I feel like I have to because I'm, uh, you know, I've been talking about this for so long and I, I feel like it's an important part of the story as uh, we continue on. I don't, I'm not an expert in this field. I want to, I want to make sure that I say that abundantly clear. I'm not an expert when it comes to abuse uh, I am, I am not, you know, I have no degree that would, you know, make it so that I am some kind of, you know, person to be looked at for these things. What I have been is a pastor and I've made mistakes as well. Uh, so I want to, I want to make sure that I'm saying that clearly because I, I don't want to just come off as, oh, well, if I was there, everything would be so much better. Um, well, maybe Maybe some things I definitely wouldn't have done, as I've talked about many times here on the channel. But uh, I just want to make sure that I'm letting you know that, that I understand that. I don't have a degree in psychology. I've got a BA, MA, MDiv, and it's all in ministry stuff. So that that's who I am. And the reason why I'm talking about this is because of who this audience is and how you've at least benefited in some way from what I've talked about here on the channel. And I feel like it's important because these stories keep on coming. So all that being said, all right, let's actually look at the report. Um, uh, Kate Shelnett wrote this. Uh, she is one of the main writers at Christianity Today. She also wrote uh, on the Bethlehem stuff. Uh, let me know if you are here and you're watching this. Uh, by hitting the like button if you like that we're still talking about this topic, okay? Uh, not that you like what has happened here, <laughs> but it's always a weird thing to say. Uh, but also hop into the chat and let me know that you're here. Uh, and if you have any questions, as we're going to just basically walk through, this is probably going to be a fairly long stream of us just walking through the article and uh, just kind of breaking it down. Uh, very interesting 
read. Okay. Um, so that's just not me trying to get you to stay for the video, but it's an interesting read. Uh, David is here and says, good evening, bro. Joe Thorne is here. Uh, I'm here as a stand. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, and, uh, Jeremy is here as well. Um, yeah, on multiple elders. Oh yeah, that was a good one. All right. Uh, let's, let's actually look at this thing. So, uh, Grace Community Church rejected elders' calls to do justice in abuse case. While a, for, uh, while a former leader hopes for change, women who sought refuge in biblical counseling at John MacArthur's church say they feared discipline for seeking safety from their abusive marriages. Now, we've talked quite a lot about that. Uh, I even broke down some of John Street's, Dr. John Street's uh, teaching when it comes to abuse there at the master's seminary. And I definitely have thoughts about, um, all the different views on counseling that they have when it comes to this issue. I think it is definitely wanting, uh, but let's, let's just start here. Last year, Han Cho concluded, uh, Grace Community Church had made a mistake. The elders had publicly disciplined a woman for refusing to take back her husband. As it turned out, the woman's fears proved true, and her husband went to prison for child molestation. <laughs> Some words I'm not supposed to say on YouTube, current voice, uh, and abuse. Uh, the church never retracted its discipline or apologized in the 20 years since. Nothing new there. We, we knew that. We've talked about that multiple times. As a lawyer and one of four officers on the elder board. Okay, let's emphasize that a little bit. This is not Dean Schmeen <laughs> on the YouTubes, or as Austin Duncan likes to talk about me on a podcast, some guy on YouTube. Um, <laughs> like it's not, it's not that. And it's not just some random guy who went to the church, a lawyer and one of four officers on the elder board at Grace Community Church. Cho was asked to study the case. He was asked to do it. All right, this, this is the elders asking him. He tried to convince the church's leaders to reconsider and at least privately make it right. He said Pastor John MacArthur told him to forget it. There it is, guys. If you want to know what John MacArthur thought, this is not Dean making up stuff. This is not gossip. This is what a lawyer who was uh, in the church, an elder, when asked about it and studying it and trying to make it right, went to John MacArthur and John MacArthur told him to, quote, forget it. The heart of a pastor. When Cho continued to call the elders to, quote, do justice on the women's behalf, he said he was asked to walk back his conclusions or resign. All right, right off the bat, we can see some strong arm tactics that were used against this elder. All right, this is a former elder saying this happened to me, not I saw this happen to someone else, not, you know, I heard through the grapevine that this happened at this other church. This is this elder saying this happened, a lawyer who they tend to be pretty particular about things that were said, all right? <laughs> and he was told, he was asked to walk back his conclusion or resign. It's been 10 months since Cho left Grace Community Church, and he has not been able to forget the woman, Eileen Gray, whose experience was described in detail last March in Julie Roy's news outlet, not blog, people. All the Julie Roy's haters it's ridiculous. The woman's just trying to seek justice for some people, and apparently that makes her a target. I'm not saying she's a theologian. I'm not saying she can't get facts wrong every once in a while. But dang, like, I, I can have a blog, okay? <laughs> the, what she does is not a blog. Yes, news outlet. Uh, though Cho stepped down quietly, he continued to hear from other women from his former church they had also uh they had also been doubted dismissed 
and implicitly or explicitly threatened with discipline while seeking refuge from their abusive marriages. Even at his new congregation, Cho began to meet visitors with connections uh, to Gray's case, which he saw as a sign of God's providence. No, he couldn't forget it. The more he learned, the more people he talked with, the more the justice weighed on his conscience, and the more concerned he grew about the church's biblical counseling around abuse. Things that we've talked about. We, I, I have a video here on my channel where I go deep into both me and my wife did, uh, again, we're not experts. We've just seen stuff and we've been through stuff and we've made some mistakes and we made some right choices. We've seen people make wrong decisions and we've learned from that. Like we, we've seen some stuff, but we're not experts, but we did have a conversation about it that I think is actually worthwhile, mostly because my wife is pretty dang smart. Um, but we have that. I also did, uh, like some reacting to, uh, the idea of biblical counseling and ACBC or whatever it's called, uh, but John Street's ministry. So this is things that are pretty well known. When you get into the idea, not just of like, okay, biblical counseling, but newthetic counseling, and you start hearing about Jay Adams a lot, it's time to run for the hills. Uh, because that means that most likely, most likely they are not going to deal with abuse in the proper way. You can get mad at me for saying that. Like, yes, I'm speaking from my own personal experience from the things that I've learned, but I can tell you that the things that are taught in Jay Adams' books on counseling, when it comes to these things, are not helpful. You want to get other stuff from it? Fine. But if you keep with those teachings, it's going to affect you when it comes to these crisis moments and a lot of pastors make mistakes if they come from that line of schooling. That's, that's what I've seen. As Cho wrote in a 20-page memo, again, lawyer, 20-page <laughs> memo, uh, to top leaders at Grace Community Church last March, quote, I genuinely believe it would be wrong to do nothing. At the end of the day, I know what I know. I cannot unknow it. And I am, in fact, accountable before God for this knowledge. And if you have labored mightily to read thus far, you are now accountable before God for it as well. Wow. This guy. This guy. Uh, this is... Sometimes you, you, you see courage and it's, it's almost remarkable <laughs> like that someone would stand up in that scenario. Cause like some of you guys might be like, Oh, of course, of course you do that. Of course you just stand up for what's right always. And you, you know, you go Martin Luther style. My, my conscience is bound to the word here. I stand, you know, all that kind of stuff. But again, it's John MacArthur and he's your pastor. And this is your church. And these are your elders telling you to back off or resign. He comes out with a 20 page memo <laughs> saying that that's courageous. Now, again, this guy wasn't around when this stuff seemed to have gone down. At least that's what I got from this. You know, he was asked to investigate. He came, he came, you know, to uh, a certain place where he understood this was the narrative. This, what was, done right this was what was done wrong and he decided to do something about it and i find that to be uh pretty pretty amazing uh it's hard to do grace community church is led by john macarthur yes we know it's some of the stuff that you got to do when you're writing an article for everyone uh, one of America's largest standing and most influential pastors, the Sun Valley, California megachurch is best known for MacArthur's preaching and prides itself on its fidelity to the Bible over the whims of the world. Uh, GCC's reach extends far beyond the crowds that fill its, uh, 3,500, uh, seat auditorium, lots and lots of stuff at the conference last March, Cho taught at shepherd's conference. Again, this is not just some scrub. <laughs> this is not just like Mr. Johnny Pew sitter. Like this, this guy is teaching at master or uh, at shepherd's conference at the conference last March. Cho taught on conscience and conviction. 
and then he lived it out. He spent the rest of the year living out the lesson. Over the summer and fall, Cho held out a faint hope that the 37-member elder board would reconsider Gray's case, praying that God would soften leaders' hearts and change their minds. So for him, it wasn't over. For him, he was saying, like, let's do something. So when I'm here on my YouTube channel, on my little tiny YouTube channel, talking about it, when Julie Royce is writing about it, when people on Twitter are talking about it, there at least was one man on this elder board who was listening, who was looking into it and saying the same thing. We need to do something about this. We need to apologize to this woman. The discipline wasn't right. We need to rethink how we do some of these counseling scenarios. He was doing that. He wanted to see them correct the mistakes of their past and do better in the future. Instead, he discovered uh, they appeared to be repeating them. Months after raising his concerns over a 20-year-old case, Cho discovered another grievous GCC counseling case. Remember, people are coming to him. In the fall of 2022, a woman reported that church leaders had advised her to move back in with her husband and not get a restraining order despite his documented grooming behaviors, infidelity, and angry outbursts. Uh, Though the case settled in January, after the woman sought court-ordered protection last year, two pastors had filed declarations on her husband's behalf. It's interesting how that always happens in those worlds. Most, I shouldn't say always, that it happens so often in those worlds where the man is believed and the woman is not. In God's providence, he kept placing reminders in front of me, completely unbidden. When my wife and I were asked by a friend to pray for a woman my wife happened to know, she reached out in concern, and we were horrified to discover the same awful patterns of counseling were still happening at GCC, Cho told uh, Christianity Today. Because again, this line of thinking, if you go with Jay Adams in that version of Nuthetic Counseling, I'm not talking about you can't use the Bible. I believe the Bible. I, I, I'm a Baptist. I believe the Bible. I think the Bible should be what a pastor uses in the counseling room. But at the same time, there are things that a pastor is not prepared to talk about that, that he, he might not have been trained in. Maybe some things that he lacks in that counseling scenario. So I do think that it's appropriate to have people who are trained in that field, especially when it comes to these crisis situations. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see here. Sorry. I've got some other buttons going on. All right. This is when I sadly came to believe beyond any personal doubt that GCC congregants who we still love could effectively be playing Russian roulette if they ever needed counseling at GCC, especially anything involving the care of a woman or children. Well, that's the majority of the congregation. Uh, I knew I could not pass by silently on the other side of the road that I needed to help this woman and to call out a warning or else the blood of the people would be on my head. For this story, CT spoke with eight women who recounted how they and others at Grace Community Church had been counseled to avoid reporting their husbands and fathers to authority. (sighs) To accept their apologies and to continue to submit to them. No consequences. I'm sure that these pastors would, of course, defend themselves and say, hey, 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 you know, we had consequences for them. You know, we were trying to hold them accountable. But that's a pastor versus the police. The police are a little bit more effective about holding people accountable, especially like looking at how things have progressed. Their victims were regularly quoted uh, scriptures on forgiveness, trust, love, and submission, much like the letter John MacArthur wrote a little girl, and were told to reconcile and return home, even in cases where they feared for their safety and their children's safety. No one from GCC responded to requests by CT to discuss the church's counseling philosophy or response to abuse or to questions about specific cases. 
Six pastors and elders were contacted for comment by phone and email repeatedly over a three-week period prior to this article's publication, as well as one former pastor and elder. This is sad. This is really sad. You know, these guys are online. You see them online. You can find Phil Johnson. He's an elder. You can find him online. You can find Austin Duncan dropping podcasts about the next Johnny MacArthur. Johnny Mac, the next Johnny Mac. Who is the next John MacArthur? You can see all that. But when you ask him, hey, how do you guys actually handle these issues of abuse? Crickets. It, it, the, it flame, flames, flames on the side of my face. You need to make it right. Cho first read about Eileen Gray's case last March after the Roy's report coverage when he said he had been asked to look over the church's handling of her case for the elder board. His review drawing from his legal background and training became part of an initial internal investigation. The church's discipline happened in 20, or 2002. I can see I already have a dislike. Mm. I'm going to ban that one. I don't know what's going on over there. Um, hey, if you're watching this and uh, you, you like the fact that we're talking about this, hit the like button. It helps to get the, the message out. Not just... Not just YouTuber Dean doing stuff to try to get more views. It's just people need to know about this. This is why Kate Shellnet wrote about it. Like, yes, this elder came out to her, but all of this was behind closed doors until Julie Roy started talking about it. It matters. Uh, the church discipline happened in 2002, a few years before Cho became, uh, came to faith at Grace Community Church. Gray had refused to follow leaders' counsel to lift a restraining order against her abusive husband, David Gray. We know this. Most likely, you know this. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip down a little bit because they're just basically going through uh, the story. Uh, but I want to I wanna really focus on Cho here and what he did about all of this. Um, because I've talked about the Eileen Gray stuff before, and you can find all that stuff here on my channel. It's important, but I already have videos about that. Uh, Cho said many leaders at Grace Community Church refused to read the Roy's report. Of course they did. Uh, some did and dismissed its findings anyways. Top leaders at the church became defensive, he said, and wanted to protect MacArthur as usually is the case. To Cho, as well as to seven Christian lawyers who reviewed the material, it was obvious that David Gray was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, and Eileen Gray's refusal to lift the restraining order to protect her children was objectively reasonable and fully vindicated. Now that the facts are indeed known, it is not too late to do justice, even at this late stage, almost 20 years later. I love this guy. I love this guy. It's not too late. You know, we messed up as a church. We messed up. And maybe you've been there. You messed up. People mess up. People say the wrong things. But it's not too late. It's not too late to do justice. He wrote to the elder board, one's own integrity and in upholding justice and righteousness and being faithful, even in the small things, even for something 20 years ago, all matter immensely. He's not saying we have to fire our pastor. He's not saying like all these elders need, you know, to get kicked off the elder board. He's saying, let's fix this. Let's apologize to Eileen. Let's, let's do something about this. It's not too late. Cho expected the church to hold itself to a higher standard than even the secular uh, than even the secular courts. In Eileen Gray's case, overseen by then associate executive pastor Kerry Hardy and involving GCC's longtime pastor of counseling Bill Shannon, he found evidence of mistreatment, bias, and errors in how they handled the case. Eileen Gray was reportedly disbelieved and accused of being bizarre which wasn't relevant to the reason for her discipline, and leaders cast doubt on her account despite David Gray's history of deceit. They sided with a child abuser who turned out to be a child, you know what, over a mother desperately trying to protect her three innocent young children. 
and that was and is flatly wrong and needs to be made right. This guy, he's... Mr. Unlimited. Cho said to CT, numerous elders have admitted in various private conversation that mistakes were made and that they would make a different decision today knowing what they know now. But those admissions mean you need to make it right with the person you wronged. That is utterly basic Christianity. Thank you. <laughs> like, it's not enough just to be like, yeah, we really screwed up, but we're not going to say about it. We're standing unified as a board, as a church. If we come out now, you know, what will happen? Also, if that is true, if these people really believe that, then John MacArthur going on stage and talking about how the internet is trying to take him down and the enemy is using the internet. You remember that? You remember that sermon that he got up there? That was super weird, right? Come on. I don't think he believed that. While still on the board last March, Cho emphasized the urgency of correcting the record. The elders had called out sin where there was none, but he insisted. If they had learned that they uh, disciplined a man wrongly accused of adultery, wouldn't they want to make that right? Even if they found out 20 years later? Hmm? According to Cho, who served as the board secretary and was responsible for taking notes, MacArthur replied during the March meeting. Okay. Once again... Like, this guy is, like, the perfect guy to be, like, in this position. A lawyer. One of the main elders speaking at Shepherd's Conference. If there was ever a guy with credibility on this, in this scenario, just, just look at this again. According to Cho, who served as the board secretary and was responsible for taking notes, MacArthur replied during the March meeting that the comparison didn't apply to Eileen Gray. The pastor brought up again claims of her bizarre behavior and wasn't inclined to reconsider her discipline. And there you have Pastor John MacArthur's response to Eileen Gray. It's right there. The pastor brought up again claims of her bizarre behavior and wasn't inclined to reconsider her discipline as my autofocus is being weird. That's what happens when you wear a hat. After that, Cho said he was told by elder board chairs Chris Hamilton that he would need to walk back his findings about the church's mistakes if he wanted to remain an elder. I feel for this guy. Man, a lot of you guys who have tried to do the right thing, you know, you, you, you made a decision and, you know, other people made a different decision. And you try to do the right thing. You could feel it. You feel what this guy is going through. After that, Cho said he was told by uh, board chair Chris Hamilton that he would need to walk back, blah, 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 blah. Cho and his wife resigned their membership the next day. Stud. Stud. That is the right thing to do. Uh, let's see what, what you guys are talking about. David says, it's also so wild that they even supported him while he was in prison and let him run their prison ministry. Yeah, talking about uh, David Gray. Yeah, weird, weird stuff. Cho is a hero for this one, right? Like you weren't there, you didn't make the decisions, but you're trying to do the right thing and hold people accountable within. He tried to work within. He didn't immediately go to Christianity Today and say, well, hey, I got an article for you. <laughs> like he didn't do that. He tried to fix it within. And then when that didn't work, <laughs> to quote that weird pastor <laughs> who was getting mad at the tech room guy, I'm going to get in my little car. I'm going to get my wife. We're going to go down the streets of that little church. <laughs> like, you're just leaving. I respect it. I respect it. He tried to do the right thing, and they just didn't want to do it. Um, and Armac is also here and says that she agrees with David. Philip, Grace Chapel is full of demons and needs a deliverance ministry. Um, yeah, this is pretty messed up. 
Um, this fall, Cho found himself once again reviewing court fi uh, filings from a member at Grace Community Church who sought a, a restraining order against her husband in hopes of protecting herself and her young children from abuse. This time, at the woman's request, certain parallels to Eileen Gray were immediately clear to him. The woman told CT she recognized the parallels, too. She said when she read about Eileen Gray last year, she thought, she thought this sounds a lot like what I've been told. And this is why we talk about these things. Because it keeps happening. It's not like, oh, this is just a story from the past. People have gotten on Julie Roy's gotten on me on my channel you know it doesn't really matter for me but like some of these people that have actual platforms and are talking to thousands of people and they get attacked by thousands of people and they keep on getting well you're just trying to bring up some stuff from the past and it doesn't matter anymore as if eileen gray doesn't matter she matters she has a soul she's she's a person her story matters but they try to be like oh it's just from the past and you're just drudging it up now because you want to create you know links and christianity today is out to get money because they keep on talking about abuse no the reason why people should keep on talking about it is because it keeps on happening this sounds a lot like what i've been told CT's policy allows victims of abuse to go unnamed for the sake of privacy and safety. Her identity and the details of her account have been verified in reporting this story. So just so you know. Whenever I made moves in the direction of the restraining order, it was be careful of the heart of retaliation, the woman said. They were telling me to back off, essentially. They were saying it was unchristian of me to seek the legal protection because Believers don't take other believers to court. What's wrong with you people? It's not what that passage means. She said she had reported to church leaders evidence of her husband's infidelity searches for mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and inappropriate behavior with her daughter starting when she was just a couple years old. Heartbreaking. A month after moving back in with her husband at the request of their pastors, she called 911 out of fear during an argument on the road and court filings obtained by CT. She stated pastor and elder Rodney Anderson told her that she should submit to her husband as unto the Lord rather than provoke him. Who's at fault? Rather than provoke him. The domestic violence officers dispatched to the scene, she said, told her not to return home. Two GCC elders went on to submit sworn statements on behalf of her husband. Anderson's declaration recounts her husband saying during counseling that he and his daughters had... Yeah, gross. Ugh. Sick. A declaration from the other pastor and elder, Brad Clausen, said that the woman came to him concerning about pictures taken by her husband. Like, there's, like, I'll let you read some of this. It's just depressing. Depressing that this is the kind of stuff that pastors were like, yeah, we'll deal with this in house. You don't need a restraining order. In the end, she said the betrayal of her church, now her former church, makes sense hurt the most i hit sub-zero spiritually i was doubting if god is real i thought if god is real but we're supposed to submit to church leaders when this is going on i'd rather die the woman said to ct even unbelievers wouldn't stand for this the woman said she saw the lord work sovereignly to lead her through the process eventually coming to see that the failures of the church doesn't nullify the existence of god or the justice of God. Perseverance of the saints, y'all. I need to fear God instead of man. Just because someone quotes a verse to you and they're in a position of authority doesn't mean they're doing it well. Man. When she challenged the pastor's advice to return to and trust her husband, she said she was reminded of passages like believes all things and that Jesus said to forgive 70 times 7. 
uh, times. According to her account, the trauma and warning signs weren't enough. The pastors wanted evidence of physical abuse. Skin-to-skin adultery or a conviction of child before agreeing she had biblical grounds for divorce. They act like divorce is like, oh, that's the sin that sends you to hell. <laughs> like, yeah, it's God hates divorce. We get it. But God also hates abuse. My safety was not the number one priority. The cases at Grace Community Church land in a larger debate around what qualifies as abuse, whether Christians should prioritize reconciliation in abuse cases with the church and its seminary holding a prominent place among conservative biblical counselors and the Association of Certified Biblical Counselors, ACBC. Again, I have a video about ACBC. A lot of people have talked out of their butts about ACBC. This is what I was taught. I know, I know people. <laughs> I, I know people. Okay. Maybe they don't know me, but I know them. <laughs> but um, ACBC, it's just not good. When Siri thinks I'm talking to her. All right. Doesn't mean biblical counseling is bad. Okay. Let me be clear, because some of you guys hear that and you're like, oh, biblical counseling. He doesn't like biblical counseling. He must be all for psychology only. As if, like, those are the only options. It's not. ACBC is a company, okay? It's a company of counseling. It is one thing. There are options outside of ACBC. There's tons of different biblical counseling um, accreditation sources that you can go and find and also some state ones too <gasps> liberal there's a fundamentally different understanding of what abuse is said jonathan holmes a graduate of the master's university and a pastor and counselor in ohio no noting that the label and the most serious responses often get reserved for physical and sexual violations absolutely <sighs> Philip says this attitude is so prevalent in churches, conservative churches, more often than not very concerning. ACBC is rough. Yeah, I will say it's not like uh, they're the only ones who get it wrong. OK, like it's not like they're the big the, they're the big evil corp. Like, that's not what I'm saying. Um, like liberals get it wrong on their counseling, too. Like. Like there, yeah, counseling is a very difficult thing and it's, it's almost like someone should be trained for it, you know, like actually trained, not just, I sat down with my pastor and we talked about it. Um, like fellow complementarians, MacArthur has preached multiple times against women staying with abusive husbands for the sake of marital submission. He taught that women and children should go to a place of safety and that perpetrators of domestic violence are no longer behaving as believers and have therefore forfeited their right to marriage. So like MacArthur teaches that from the pulpit. So just to be clear, like, these are things that are said behind closed doors, not what's been said from the pulpit, or at least uh, they, they would say that it's not contrasting, but I think we can clearly see how it's contrasting, but they would think that it was, this is how they do it. But yet as Cho brought up in his letters to key elders last year, a string of women over the past decade uh, said they received different counsel at his church when they feared for their safety or their children's safety, right? It's always, oh, He's going to hurt the kid. Yeah, get him out. It's like, why did we have to wait? <laughs> like, Why did we have to wait for it to get this bad? Or for you to have proof on this before you say, oh, yeah, you should definitely, you know, get out of the house. Like, I'm not saying I know exactly when that moment is, but I think that it's before that. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not a genius, but... That's just my view. Uh, multiple women named Bill Shannon, a pastor of counseling and ACBC fellow, as discouraging them from reporting abuse 
abuse to police and directing them to stay in homes where they had been threatened with violence. So there's a lot about these elders that's getting brought up in this article. One couple said they observed a counseling session where Shannon failed to advise a member of their family to report a man who had confessed to an incident of child. Hmm. They also did not direct her to leave him since he hadn't been convicted. And again, leaving him does not mean automatic divorce okay like if that's what people are thinking oh well if you leave it's just going to be a divorce i mean it probably will get there (laughs) but it doesn't necessarily mean that uh shannon is among the leaders who did not respond to multiple requests for comment for this story current and former elders had also raised concern about shannon's incompetent counsel cho said and just fyi i'm reading here Okay. Sometimes I get a little nervous when I talk about these things for legal ramifications. I'm reading an article. <laughs> that's, that's all I'm doing. Uh, Cho's the, the heroic one. I'm I'm the coward saying, I'm reading an article. Cho said MacArthur had been warned about the concerns, but has defended Shannon and kept him in the same position. According to GCC's website, Shannon continues to provide formal and informal counseling to members teach the church's premarital and marriage seminar and preach sermons for an adult small group. Some tells me he's not going to be the next JMAC. In the first meeting with Bill Shannon, it was made known that my safety was not the number one priority. It was submission in my marriage, said one woman who asked not to be named in the story because she is attempting to move on from her time at Grace Community Church. My job was not to rile my husband up. While the woman was hospitalized due to her husband's physical abuse, Shannon called her and advised her to go home without calling police. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. I just don't understand that. At times, the torment at home was bad enough that she worried she was going to die, but she said she was told that her situation may be God's will for her life. In marital counseling, pastors asked wives whether their attitudes contributed to the patterns of violence, anger, and manipulation in their relationships in some situations. They implied women were looking for fault in their husbands. It's hard for a pastor to conceive of a dynamic where a woman is receiving mistreatment, where at some point along the road she is not expressly responsible for it, Holmes said. That's that um, student from Masters. This mutilization of sin can take place in church settings where both a mutualization of sin can take place in church settings where both parties are asked to confess and seek forgiveness from each other. Our philosophy is that if there's been abuse, you don't put them into a room and expect them to go through the process of getting the log out of their eyes, said Ken Sand, a Christian mediator who spoke of patterns he's seen over decades of conciliation ministry, not about GCC in particular. This article is awesome. What a what a great job Kate Shellnut is doing here. Like using, of course, Cho's story, but also showing like the, the errors of this line of thinking of of counseling. And I'm not saying that every ACBC counselor is like this. Just saying. I know probably some people, I know some people who like, again, I know, I know some people, um, but I do know even some people who watch regularly here on my YouTube have gone through this certification process with ACBC. I'm not saying every counselor is, but I don't think that as like my opinion of it is that it's not good. You don't have to agree with me, but that's my opinion of it. And I (laughs) exhibit a (laughs) is right here. Um, but man, I just really appreciate, uh, what, what Kate Shelnett is doing here and building it up, not just being like Joe MacArthur bad 
you know, like just being like, here, here it is laid out of here's this case that you guys all know. Here's a little bit more about the background of what was happening behind the scenes when everyone was talking about this last year. And here's how it's progressed. And here's some more stories to show that there is a pattern. There is a pattern of this and the connecting dots are all about this line of thinking of counseling uh, of this extreme form. I would, I would say that extreme form of newthetic counseling. David, uh, Philip, the problem is we do understand it. Can't allow our biases or other preconceived notions to make us look away from the truth. Uh, cause Philip said, I really don't understand the handling of this by grace at all. It turns my stomach. I mean, I, I agree. Uh, it's exactly what it looks like. Uh, let's see. Armac. So they know women are to submit the, uh, to their husbands, but can show me one, but can you show me one place where Jesus encouraged the type of abuse or put children in harm's way or are men not to love their wives as Christ loved the church? Absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. Appreciate it, Bill. Yeah, isn't that interesting, Jared? So don't report abusers to the police, but we won't believe they're abusive without a criminal conviction. That's the position they put these women in. Seems like it. Seems like it from this article. Um, let's go just a little bit more. We might not hit all of it, um, but no other choice. Each of the women CT spoke with said at some point they considered themselves partly responsible for their husband's behavior or had a church leader indicate they were. The women were reminded of the biblical directive for wives to submit to their husbands. For years, they had hoped their submission, their faithfulness in marriage, and their desperate prayers would eventually lead to change in their husbands. But when issues persisted and escalated, they sought help and counsel on what else could be done. It takes a tremendous amount of courage, humility, and vulnerability to even seek help from the church when there has been uh, has been abuse in the home, said Wendy Gway, who spoke to the Roy's report last year about abuse by her father, Paul Gway, while he was on staff at Grace Community Church in the late 1970s. Women have hidden, persevered, and tried to handle things on their own, so there was no other choice, she added. When wives felt like they needed to move out for their safety, they said pastors told them to stay. After they had separated or secured legal protection, they said pastors urged them to reconcile. Women told CT that pastors saw their husbands' continued involvement in counseling, caring treatment of their kids in supervised settings, and verbal promises. Oh, can I stop for a second and say how bizarre that is? That the pastors... The pastors are in charge of supervised visits with the kids. That is nuts. Okay. Like what, what is that? Are pastors all just like sitting there watching and like looking at, do they know what to look for? I'm sure they're trying. Like, le, like, let me get that. Like a lot of these people who make mistakes off of how to counsel when they make the mistakes most of the time it's out of ignorance, not because they're trying to hurt anyone or overlook things. It's because of their ignorance or their bias. And then later on, it's about covering up and making sure, you know, oh, well, it wouldn't, wouldn't really do any good now to bring that up or to, you know, they, those, that person probably moved past it. They haven't. Well, maybe they should, you know, like that, that's what they do after. But most of the time they, they aren't doing it because like they're evil <laughs> they're trying but i just don't see how pastors are like trained in some specific way and i know this stuff with acbc because i have like those those are the counseling courses that i took in bible college and seminary it was that line of thinking of acbc so i get it okay um so bizarre that they're the ones in charge of supervised visits with the kids and verbal promises that the abuse would stop. 
uh, as indications that they no longer pose a threat. In some cases, oh, junk. In some cases, uh, let me go back down here. Like those of Eileen Gray and the women who agreed to a settlement last month, leaders at Grace Community Church went on to support the men they had accused of abuse in legal cases. Although certain churches may avoid legal involvement in marital disputes for liability reasons, it's not unheard of to have pastors siding with the accused. Pete Singer, the executive director of Grace, godly responses to abuse in the Christian environment. I'm just saying, like, why do we have to do these acronyms? Um, that, that seeing faith leaders defend a perpetrator in court was part of what prompted prosecutor Boz Chekvegian uh, to start the organization in the first place. It's not unique. It's unfortunately prevalent in child case and intimate partner violence as well it's a reflection of how the pastor has been groomed singer said if there is a noticeable power differential uh, why am i lining up on the side of the person who may be the oppressor and not the person who may be oppressed uh, let's see samantha is here and says in other words staying married is more important than safety yeah i think that's that pretty much sums some of that up uh, Bill says, submit doesn't mean be a carpet or a punching bag. I have no words for how this is handled. Uh, remember, guys, you remember? Like, John Street, one of the main guys for ACBC, the, the head of counseling at Masters, I believe. I th- Is it Masters University or the Bible College? I don't know. One of those. He is in charge of the counseling department. He's a bigwig when it comes to counseling. He said that uh, a married woman who is abused is similar to a missionary. And you don't take the missionaries out when there's danger. He said that. Okay? Like, ever, like I said, that's crazy. And I got so many comments from people being like, oh, that like you're just taking one thing out of context. And that's not the philosophy that they would use in counseling. Here it is. Like these things that people say, it matters because that's their thinking. You say what you think and you do as you think. Like, I don't know why that's so complicated. I don't know why everyone gets on my case about it. When people say things, I think it matters. I don't know why that's such a controversial thing. But man, uh, let's, let's move on a little bit. Let's go uh, to the bottom. You could, you could read all this. It's, it's phenomenal reporting. It really is. Uh, let's, let's see. Yeah. Let's go to this last section. Let God take care of the results. Eileen Gray said, uh, hearing about other women who had been blamed, accused, and often re-traumatized by leaders at Grace motivated her to share her account publicly years later, once her children were adults. Immediately after last year's coverage in the Royce report, she said she learned of even more testimonies of mishandled abuse. Would my sharing sooner have brought about change at Grace Community Church or other churches who follow their leadership model? I don't know, but I feel horrible about enabling effect, uh, the enabling effect my silence has had through the years, she told CT in an email. To this day, I have direct testimonies from a multitude of witnesses that Grace Community Church is still following a similar unbiblical and unloving way of treating abused women and children who cry out to church leaders for help while suffering under their abusive husbands and fathers. This is an egregious sin. Amen. One former member of Grace once uh, excited, uh, excited to move to California to be able to sit under MacArthur's teaching said the, uh, the faith that had meant everything to her was destroyed by the way the church treated her when she sought help during and after her, after an abusive, unloving marriage. That's so sad. The worst thing of all, it wasn't the divorce. It was my relationship with God. I know God is God and man is man, but I really trusted those people at the church. She said, they took that closeness that I had with God away. They made me look differently at men. When I go to church, I feel like the pastors are lying. They left me brokenhearted. I really feel like I was spiritually. 
Grace Community Church has not apologized to Eileen Gray, rescinded its discipline, or made a public statement on the case, nor did it offer a response for this article. Just days after Christmas last year, Cho sent what he called a final appeal to each of the GCC elders. Cho still held, uh, held out that faint hope. The Lord has so often done far, far more than I ever could have thought possible, even knowing that the board was unlikely to move and that his public stance would upset many he used to serve and worship alongside. At the end of the day, I need to do what's right, as the spirit of my conscience and prayer and counsel and word all lead me, and let God take care of the results, he told CT. And the man who taught me that was John MacArthur. There it is. Now, here's where we come and we, we have to say, now what? What will happen? What will happen? I hope that you go to Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. I don't know. Go all over whatever platform you choose and you talk about this. You don't have to share my video. You could just share the article. Go and share the article. Go on to Facebook. Yeah, you'll probably get Aunt Joan, who's just upset because John MacArthur is her guy. You'll get all, you know, a lot of feedback. Most likely if you go on Facebook, Twitter, you'll probably get a lot of people who will agree. Um, that's why I like <laughs> that's why I like it on Twitter. Uh, but go on to your social media and share that article. And let people know that this is what's going on. Because it's not just Dean on YouTube and all those jerks who just want clicks. And they just want to grow their platforms. And how dare Christianity Today write so many articles about the rise and fall of Mars Hill. And after the rise and fall of Mars Hill, do you know how many more they... Enough of that. People need to talk about this stuff because it matters because it's still happening. It matters, yes, because those people that it happened to, of course. But it continues to happen. It's happening right now. Most likely, statistically speaking, a church of 3,500, which we all know it's bigger than that. All right, the church, the people that it ministers to, there are thousands there. Statistically, most likely, there is something going on at that church right now of a case of a, of a husband and a wife, and what they're going through. It matters for them. Share it. Maybe if enough people make a ruckus, if enough people talk about this, if enough people share about it, if enough people just don't ignore it, don't get wrapped up in, oh, it's you know the 24-hour news cycle, we'll just move on to the next thing. What happened to John Piper's church? You know, like... Let's sit with this and just say this happened, share it on our social media, and try to get someone to listen. Cho listened. Cho probably didn't know about it until Julie Royce reported it, right? Cho wasn't Julie Royce's source. Julie Royce started talking about it because Eileen Gray, she, she got into contact with her. She wrote about it. Cho listened, tried to do something. And now we know his story as well. And we know that there are more and more of these stories there at that church. And I guarantee you more and more of those kinds of stories within churches that are aligned with that counseling philosophy. Let's talk about it. And maybe someone at that church will listen. And maybe somehow there can be accountability for this bubble that refuses to answer anything. What was, what was that line that we, we saw right off the bat from John MacArthur? What did the lawyer uh, say? Not what did the fox say, but what did the lawyer say? He could forget it. Don't let, don't let John MacArthur, I know he's having health issues, okay? And there are going to be people who are going to be like, well, John MacArthur is in the hospital 
or John MacArthur is resting from home, these people just want to have it out for him. No. Enough is enough. Like, let's talk about this and maybe get through to that bubble that refuses to answer any questions, that refuses any accountability from outside of themselves. Yes, I know about the autonomy of the local church, but how about those elders act like elders? Cho did. It's not that complicated. Say we're sorry. Say let's look into our counseling philosophy. There's obviously some problem here if all these women have these stories. Maybe do something about it. I don't know. That's just my thoughts. Uh, I think I'm all done. I hope that something happens and that someone at that church maybe stops making a podcast for five seconds and stop putting out their videos and promoting all their stuff and, you know, doing all the organization stuff for a second and maybe be like, oh, snap, did we do something wrong? Maybe we should actually own up to that. Just my thoughts. But what do I know? To quote Austin Duncan, I'm just a guy on YouTube. So I'll see you in the next one.